All right, so let's see if I can flip this. So, does anyone know what this is? Hands up if you know. Or you have to guess. It's some type of fingerprint. Um, this is actually a J4 fingerprint of Sliver, uh, the um, command and control uh, framework Sliver. Um, so what the J4 uh, fingerprints do is that they fingerprint the TLS handshake of the client specifically. So this particular fingerprint is a fingerprint of one single handshake. Um, the fingerprint contains lots of different parts. I will actually mention them uh, a bit more in detail later on. Uh, but what I can say is that this is not technically, it's not really a fingerprint of Sliver. It's actually a fingerprint of the TLS implementation that Sliver is using. Uh, my name is Erik Jelmvik. I run a very small software company called Netrasec. And my name is Jonas Leon, and I'm a cybersecurity specialist at Triop. And uh, me and Erik, we used to work together uh, about 14 years ago or something at the Swedish uh, military cyber defense. And also, this is an ad from the military from the 70s. And it's somehow related to what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, the things that we're going to talk about today is was, um, uh, so to say, invented or uh, in the, about the year 2000. And one of the first tools that was available was POF. And POF was created by Michel Savensky. Um, and um, he had this idea that you can fingerprint uh, TCP SYN packets. And he made a small database and published his idea. Uh, POF is still around, and the current version is uh, 3, and he implemented some of more things into the tool. Um, also, uh, GA3 and GA3S was uh, published about uh, 2017, and we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, GA3 uh, further on. And as many of you maybe heard of, NMAP is a... Uh, it's a port scanning tool, and it's been around also uh, since the 98. And it has been, you, it has a database for OS detection. And also what's important to say is that uh, NMAP is doing active fingerprinting, both of operating systems and also nowadays it also has a database so you can do protocol identification. So it tries to identify the protocol, for example, on a listening um, TCP or UDP port. So what is network fingerprinting? Um, yeah, so as Eric mentioned, it can be used for fingerprinting, for example, which application is running, which operating system, and communication or TLS libraries, for example. It can also be used to fingerprint devices. Uh, for example, in my home, I can fingerprint that this is a toaster or this is a car uh, speaking or talking on the network. And it can mainly be done on uh, two different types. It can be done on passive, sniffing packets or listening on passively on the network uh, uh, using PCAP or Wireshark or any of these uh, tools, for example or on a Wi-Fi network or something like that. It can also be done actively when we are sending packets into the network or to a host, for example. Uh, and of course, there are different types of uh, protocols, different types of uh, solutions, so to say, or methods for both of these things. And we're going to cover uh, a little bit scratch on the surface on both of these things. Uh, and why would you like to do this? Why, why, are, why are things happening and why are we talking about this today? Yes, and it's because of these days more and more traffic on the internet is encrypted. And when traffic is encrypted, we need to look at other things, and such as metadata, for example. And fingerprinting these things is, is getting more and more important. 
Uh, it can also be used for identifying malware, uh, command and control servers, and other bad stuff on the internet. Uh, for example, backdoors. Um, and when you uh, combine these things together, uh, you can get uh, more indicat indicators of there is something might bad going on also. Uh, it can also be used for anti-censorship identification for anonymity networks such as Tor. Uh, right, and for Tor, for example, like if we take that example, uh, repressive regimes like China might want to keep track of who's trying to circumvent uh, the censorship, uh, for example, by using Tor or a VPN. And in China, they have this great firewall of China that can be detect that, hey, this traffic looks like it's maybe Tor traffic. And they also have the capability to send the TCP reset packets to take down those type of uh, communications that they don't like. Yep. And it's also implemented in web application firewalls, WAFs, because they also need to somehow to block or they need to detect, for example, which type of um, service that's sending or which type of service that is listening on the both sides. It can also be used for uh, prevention, uh, such as distributed denial of service attacks and quality of, sh of service, for example, when you need to, like, uh, uh, do different types of things and different types of, of packets or, or protocols, for example. Uh, also, this is uh, some statistics from Google uh, when it comes to how much of the traffic, uh, web traffic, is encrypted. And uh, if we look at Windows, uh, it's around 94% uh, encrypted traffic. And it has been 94% for about the last year, so what we can see. And uh, wh why it's different, uh, different uh, operating system, for example, for Linux and Mac and Android, it depends usually on, on several different things, but it's not something that we're going to get into uh, today, why it's different. And speaking of browsers, what is this? This, was, this is probably a bit easier, right? Um, this is, of course, a user agent from a browser. Um, so this type of user agent string gets sent every time a browser does a GET or a POST request. It will communicate with the server and send the GET request, and then there's a user agent header that will probably look something like this. Um, but as Jonas mentioned, over 90% of web traffic is encrypted now which means if we passively sniff traffic, we will not see this user agent um, because it will be inside the TLS layer. But the server side will see the user agent because uh, the server will see the clear text traffic, of course. Um, another alternative is to use some type of TLS inspection proxy. Then the proxy can also see this user agent. And as you can see at the end of the user agent, it says Firefox version 39. So just by seeing this user agent, we can make a qualified guess that this is probably a Firefox browser. And in the beginning, in the parenthesis, it says Windows NT 6.0. So OK, this is probably a Windows computer making this uh, request. Um, and malware, of course, also communicate over HTTP. And it's not like malware is going to say, hey, I am uh, running Metasploit version, version this and that uh, in the GET request. Uh, so what malware typically does is that they just copy some or take some random uh, uh, user agent and use that. So you, you often have hard-coded user agents in malware. And that's good for us defenders because we can then detect that this particular user agent is associated with this particular malware, and we can detect that. Of course, some malware vendors or malware authors try to be smart and just pick a super common user agent. So let's say they pick uh, Chrome on Windows 10, which is very common, uh, and use that as a user agent. Well, that works in many cases, but not always, because let's say the infected computer is running Windows 7, or like in this one, it's actually Windows Vista. And then all of a sudden, that Vista computer starts using a Windows 10 user agent. <laughs> then you have like an anomaly. So one single computer claims to be running different operating systems at the same time. So that's something that we can alert on. Um, and by the way, how do I know that it's Windows Vista? 
Well, uh, it says Windows NT 6.0, and that's called the platform token. Um, so let me give you just a short history lesson about platform tokens. Um, Windows NT 4.0 was released in 1996, um, and Windows NT 4.0 had the platform token Windows NT 4.0. Very good, so they're matching, right? So that's why I give them this green little check mark at the end. Um, then Windows 2000 was released. Uh, it got platform token 5.0, so no check mark for that one. I think that uh, internally uh, Windows 2000 was called NT 5.0, uh, but they published it as Windows 2000, so I guess there's a reasonable explanation for that. Uh, then Windows XP got version 5.1, Windows Vista got 6.0, but then finally, um, in 2009, Windows 7 was released, and Windows were going, Microsoft were going back to giving their Windows version like numbers again, uh, which meant that they now have the possibility to go to Windows NT 7.0 as the platform token. But for some reason, <laughs> they just decided, no, we're going to use 6.1 as the platform token. Uh, it's a bit crazy, but you know, uh, I, I, I don't have the backstory for that. Uh, then Windows 8 still didn't make it into Windows NT8. They call it NT6.2. Uh, but then we know what happened. Windows 10 got released. And finally, it's now Windows 10 has platform token Windows NT 10.0. So you can see that in the user agent of the browser. Uh, but now we have Windows 11, of course. And for some reason, Microsoft did not bump the platform token for Windows 11. So a Windows 11 computer will still say, hey, I'm running Windows NT 10.0 in the user agent. Um, we'll see what happens with Windows 12. My gut feeling is that in Windows 12, we'll still be seeing this uh, NT 10.0 user agent. But, you know, let's see. All right. Um, I mentioned JA4 at the beginning of the talk, uh, but there's a precursor to that one. Like the previous version, it was called JA3, which is probably still a bit more popular than JA4. So what JA3 does is that it also fingerprints TLS handshakes. Uh, so it takes a lot of input from the client hello in TLS. Uh, like you can see the TLS version, which cipher suites it supports, with extensions, TLS extensions it supports, and some configuration of elliptic curve cryptos. So it takes all that data, builds a very, very long string with all that information, and then they just do an MD5 sum of that string. And that MD5 hash that is what we call the JA3 fingerprint, or the JA3 hash. Uh, so here you have an example, this A85BE string. That's a, what a JA3 hash can look like. Uh, JA4 is the newer version, which is a bit smarter. So it takes the same type of input. They also add a few additional fields from the TLS client handshake. Uh, and then they build a, a string that looks something like this. Uh, it actually contains two hashes, so this is one hash of the ciphers, and this is one hash of the algorithms um, f for uh, uh, the, the hash of signature algorithms and TLS extensions that are supported. But then at the beginning, this is not a hash. This is clear text information, which is good because that's readable to the human eye. Uh, so just to give you an example, the T says that this uh, this um, TLS handshake is being made over TCP instead of UDP because TLS also runs on QUIC. Uh, but this is a TLS based handshake and 13 means it's running TLS version 1.3 and then uh, I stands for that uh, for some reason no SNI, this server name indicator that's used to tell the server which domain name you want to communicate with, it was not used. So that's why it's an I. And then 19 means that there are 19 ciphers uh, that the client supports. Um, and one advantage with uh, J4 over J3 is that um, one thing that often happens is that TLS stacks get updated. Uh, let's say there's like the minor, the most common update is maybe that a new cipher is added to the TLS implementation. 
If you think about what J3 did is that they take build this long string and do an MD5 hash of that. And that long string contains all the ciphers that you support. So if you add one more cipher, it's a minor change in the input, it will generate a completely different MD5 output. So there's no way to see that, hey, these two MD5 hashes had similar inputs. As a user, you have no way to detect that. But for J4, uh, if we take the same example, someone adds a new TLS uh, or a new cipher to the library, then only this purple middle part uh, will be updated with a new hash. But the last part will remain the same because it's still the same extensions and signature algorithms. And in the first part, the only thing that will change here is that this number 19 will be bumped to 20 because now it supports 20 uh, ciphers. Um, so there is at least some way you can see that, hey, these two TLS implementations look similar to each other. Yeah, and it's also important when you're doing, for example, threat hunting and you're looking at different signatures, you have maybe, maybe five or ten different signatures. It's, as Eric says, it's easy for the human eye to see that, okay, here is a difference. Then you can investigate further, okay, why is there a um, change or, uh, between these different types of uh, signatures? Uh, but there are many types of fingerprints. Um, and depending on what you want to fingerprint, there's uh, a lot of different places you want to look at. So, like, if we go start from the bottom here, uh, if we look at Ethernet or Wi-Fi traffic, you typically, the input to those type of fingerprints is typically the MAC address. And you can use the MAC address to find out who built the uh, network interface card um, and so on. But if you go further up in the stack, uh, if you want to identify the operating system, yeah, I, I recommend looking at the TCP and IP implementation or maybe protocols like DHCP, which are also quite typical to the OS. Uh, end up in the application layer on top. Uh, I mentioned user agents, but of course, if you think about it, what IDSs like Snort and Suricata do is that they identify the application, which could be like which type of malware a client is running. Um, and that's, of course, detecting that through the application layer traffic. Yeah, yeah. and um, so the things that we are going, that we're talking about today, there are like no silver bullet here. We need to, first of all, combine different types of uh, fingerprinting. And also the things that we have been talking about today, they're not new things. Many of these things has been done before. So what's important here is that there's um, so to say, a standardized way into, for example, changing, exchanging uh, signatures or fingerprints. So we can see, okay, we have seen these things on our network. Have you seen this on your network? And as uh, Eric mentioned before, GA4 is a whole suite of uh, new, new uh, uh, fingerprints and uh, uh, methods of fingerprinting. And it's also called GA4+. Plus. And many of these things are licensed by Fox IO, but GA4, for example, can be used uh, for free commercially, uh, but the others are uh, available on, on uh, license. Uh, they're open source, you can uh, look into them. Uh, we will not cover them all in, in detail, but what we're going to look into is, uh, for example, GA, GA4 SSH. Uh, there's another way of fingerprinting uh, since before called uh, HA. SSH, and if we look at the difference between HH SSH and GA4 SSH, uh, GAH SSH can be used to fingerprint uh, the client and the server. So you can get a um, baseline, for example, on your network, so you know, okay, these are the clients and servers that I'm seeing, uh, SSH clients and servers that I'm seeing on the network. Uh, within, but you can use GA4 SSH is looking into the sessions, uh, independent on the, what type of server and client there is. So for, with GA4 SSH, you can, for example, in, see that, okay, this is an automated transfer, for example, over SSH. And you can see, okay, this is a, a connect back shell, for example, and such things uh, when you're using uh, GA4 SSH. And many of these are, this is a screenshot from, from uh, GitHub. 
Uh, yeah, she also mentioned that hey, a SSH are uh, doing a, a hash on the server and also has hash on the client and the hash is built on, for example, the ciphers uh, that are being used. All right, so this is what an IPv4 packet looks like. Um, and parts of these packets, I'm, I, or parts of these fields I've colored in purple. And those purple parts are things that can be implemented differently by different operating systems. So if we take the time to live value, for example, uh, Windows computers typically have an uh, initial time to live of 128 when they send packets. Linux computers typically use 64 as the initial time to live. And if we look at uh, Cisco IOS devices, they go with a maximum 255 when they send packets. So that's why if you sniff packets passively you, and you see the time to live field, you can make a qualified guess of the initial time to live and make a guess about which operating system might be sending those packets. Um, same thing for TCP. There are also some fields that you know, aren't specified. Uh, you know, it's up for the implementer to decide what to use, uh, like the uh, TCP initial window size, for example. There are many ways you could, like, I'm going to start with this window size, and different OSs use with different window sizes. So that's something that we can detect passively uh, and match that to a particular uh, operating system. Uh, in my tool, Network Miner, here on the left, uh, I use these properties. So I, every time I see a TCP handshake, Network Miner looks at these particular fields and tries to identify the operating system. And the way it does that is that it uses a few different databases where people have run a lot of traffic through something that they have no, no, know which operating systems they are, and then uh, build a big database of that. So Jonas mentioned POF, for example. Uh, and uh, so I'd like to thank Michal Zawelski for creating POF, Carnegie Mellon CERT. They also created their own POF databases. And then a guy called Eric Coleman has created a really great database called Satori. He has both a TCP database for TCP handshakes and a DHCP database. Yeah, so uh, we talked a lot about, about, about passive fingerprinting, but if we look into active fingerprinting, uh, there was a tool released a couple of years ago called Yarm. And so what Yarm is doing is sends uh, 10 uh, packets, 10 TLS client hello packets, and it looks at the result, and what comes up is um, something, a fuzzy hash called, something that looks like this. It's uh, 62 characters, and uh, in this case, uh, this is a malware uh, listening on port 31337, uh, sliver gRPC in this case. And if we look uh, how to create this hash, um, it's quite, easy to download the tool called Jorm from GitHub, and we can use Jorm, and we specify the, the port number and the target, um, and we get a signature back. Um, and also, uh, in, in the second case here, I'm testing Jorm, doing active fingerprinting on port 8834. And so, if we break down the the signature, the Yarm active fingerprint signature in this case. Uh, we have the first 30 characters uh, that's, um, that's sending, and we, as we can see here, the first TLS hello packet being sent didn't return anything. The second didn't return anything, so there are a lot of zeros in the front here. But we can see that scanning seven, eight, and 10 packets are, we have something that being returned. And so, for example, packet uh, 10 is scan 10, and also uh, the second part, uh, the second uh, 32 char characters in the hash is the hash of the extension that being uh, returned. Um, so this is also uh, readable by the human eye, quite. <laughs> and we will look into further on into uh, what we can do with this hash. Right, and I mentioned uh, POF and Satori databases so far, but there's also, quite recently, this summer, a JA4 database was released, or was published on ja4db.com. So you can go there, download 
the whole database and use it. Uh, and there's also open source implementations of J4 hashes that can be used to build the fingerprints. And as you can see, this is a screenshot from uh, the GA4DB.com. And if we, uh, it has a very nice graphical representation of the breakdown of the signature, as Eric explained further on. So the first part is, uh, is, is uh, you can find here, and second part and the third part. And in this case, we, we searched for uh, the sliver agent, and we got the hits in the database. And there are also other databases available, uh, several on GitHub, for example. Uh, there's also on VirusTotal, you can see the GA3 and GA3S. And uh, as Eric mentioned before, GA3 has been around for a long time, so there are a lot of more fingerprints available on the internet uh, for GA3. Uh, and also, what I should mention is that if you download, for example, the GA4 database and you run it on your own network, you will get a lot of overlaps since, for example, many browsers and many applications use have the same fingerprint. So it's important that you investigate and see, okay, why are there overlaps in the, in the fingerprints, for example. So, some final words. What should you remember from, from this talk? <laughs> uh, that the, what we have been talking about today, there's no silver bullet here, but there are good indicators that you need to look into further on. And most traffic these days, protocols are encrypted, and we will see more and more uh, encryption. And there is also a lot of false positives. So we, what we usually recommend is that you combine different methods, for example, active and passive fingerprinting, for example, and other uh, threat intelligence such as the X509 attributes, IP, DNS, and, and such things that, uh, that you can do and look into. And there's also this problem of false positives that you must mention. Uh, but another source of false positives is that internet is full of middle boxes. So if you're, like, let's say your traffic passes out to the internet through a proxy, uh, then uh, if you're trying to do a TCP IP fingerprinting of that traffic, you will actually be fingerprinting the proxy rather than the actual user. Same thing for uh, anything that does TLS offloading for a server. So let's say there's a load balancer that terminates TLS. If you try to fingerprint the server by using JA3 or JA4S, um, then you're actually fingerprinting the load balancer's TLS implementation, not the server. So it's some things to be aware of. And we don't have any time left, but uh, a few words about anti-fingerprinting. The bad guys knows about these things, so they try to uh, try to do obfuscations and dif in different uh, types. Uh, for example, we, we have been talking about the Sliver malware framework. Uh, they uh, have uh, JARM um, randomization um, by default, so it's really hard to uh, fingerprint when it's come to the beacon listener. Um, so that's it for us, yeah. and we will be around here. Thank you. So, so um, we're into the coffee break time now, so if you have any questions for these guys, can you grab them in the coffee break? But for now, please join me in thanking them for a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.